Hello friends! In this video we're going to take a look at what happens when Node dies. Ah oh, yes, so sad. Don't worry, we can resurrect it and we'll take a look at how to do that both locally and how Azure does it. So first off let's talk about why this would ever even happen. We're going to use something that is more likely to be used in production. So we're going to use Express and a simple application that I've created with the Express CLI. Now, if we take a look at the package.json file here, we can see that this app is running directly against Node, which is expected, and we can execute it locally with npm start. Okay, no surprises there. Now, let's add a scenario that might cause our application to crash. Let's do something that is kind of common, like referencing a property on a variable that doesn't exist. Now, any error in Node that's unhandled should cause it to crash. So normally we would wrap this in a try catch to make sure that doesn't happen, but just for a forcing function of learning, let's just leave it out of a try catch and run this to see what actually happens. If we visit the read endpoint, Express shows us an actual pretty error. Now, this is very interesting because Express is actually handling this error for us in its middleware. So even though we didn't catch the error, Express did because our code is running inside of Express which is wrapping everything in a try catch and it's using its error module to prevent unhandled errors from just obliterating node. So that's pretty cool. But you're not completely safe because there are actually some scenarios where believe it or not, not even wrapping your code in a try catch is going to save you. So you can actually crash node from inside a try catch in certain scenarios. Seriously. All right, so check this out. Suppose we want to return a PDF file from this read endpoint. I've got Homer's classic The Iliad here, which looks like a great book, according to the Cliff Notes. I don't know, I didn't read it in high school. I was busy with other things. Anyway, it is available online as a free ebook, and I want to return this enormous file when someone goes to the read endpoint of the app so they can read The Iliad. I can do that in Node by using a stream. Now, streams are really cool because they chunk the data into memory. And that means instead of loading this whole enormous file into memory on the server and then returning it, it loads in chunks, which is much more efficient. And even cooler than that is that the response object in Express is a writable stream. So we can just pipe this stream into that one and then return it to the browser. Streams are just a super efficient way to work with enormous files. Now, by the way, Notice how we have to constantly stop and restart our server to get it to pick up our changes? That kind of sucks a lot for development. So instead, let's add a new script to our package.json, uh, a dev script, which will use the supervisor package to restart our app whenever we change files. So it's like a hot reload for Node. In case you haven't seen the NPX syntax before, this is something that comes with NPM. So if you've got NPM, you have NPX. And it allows you to use a package without actually installing it. It's really great. It's great for things like Supervisor that you don't want in your app and you would prefer not to install things globally. So it's kind of like a commitment-free NPM relationship here. Now we'll start the app with npm run dev and we'll navigate to the read endpoint. And boom, we can read the Iliad. Pretty nifty, right? I told you, streams are so rad. Now here's a true fact. I can't spell worth a crap. I don't even know how to spell the word Iliad. Does it have one L or two? The answer is one, but I originally assumed it was two. So this is how I would originally have written this method. This file doesn't exist because I've misspelled it as the developer. So let's check out what happens when we run this route. If we go back to the read endpoint and hit refresh, we get a nasty browser error which is weird because I thought I handled this error. It's in a try catch that shouldn't have happened. So let's look in the terminal and see what we've got here. And yikes, it looks like node actually crashed, although it says exited, which sounds better than crashed, and then supervisor restarted it. Now it turns out that you have to handle the error event on streams. Try catch will try, but it won't catch. Now, this is a pretty bad error because when this app runs in production with npm start, it's going to go directly against Node. So there's nothing like Supervisor running in production because it's simply not meant for that. Supervisor is a development tool. 
So theoretically speaking, in production, this app would go down and stay down until we manually restarted it, which would be really bad. So let's just go ahead and deploy this to Azure and find out what happens in Azure, even though we think we, we already know, or at least I do. So as usual, I'm using the app service extension for VS Code so I can deploy directly from my editor. You can check out episode two if you want to know more about this nifty extension. All right, so we have deployed. And if we go to the read route, we get an error, but hey, it's not as ugly as the one that we got locally. So that's nice, it's an improvement, but it's still an error. And if we go back to the root, oh, we get the same error. This app looks like it is indeed down for everyone, just like I suspected. But what I discovered was that if you refresh the page enough times, it comes back. Something restarted it. What is happening here? The answer to this lies in the logs. If we look at the Docker log here, you can see that Azure saw that our container was unhealthy and it restarts it. This is called container orchestration. Azure is doing that for you behind the scenes and you get it for free. So if your containers go down and your app crashes, Azure actually sees that and it restarts your container. But it does take a second for our container to come back online. And that's why we saw some downtime there. And we want to avoid that if possible. So to do that, we have a few options in Azure. First, I want to show you the optimal solution or the prime solution here. If we go to the Azure portal and click on scale out, we can add more instances of our application. Now, how many instances you can have and whether or not you can auto scale, in other words, Azure will add instances as there's load and remove them when there isn't, depends on what sort of service plan you have. We're on the B1 tier, the lowest tier. And that gives us up to three instances, but also note that we can't auto scale. So this means if our CPU usage goes way up, it's not going to automatically scale and accommodate the load. So what we're going to go ahead and do here, though, is add three instances. And let's go ahead and save that. Now, if we go back to the site and hit the read endpoint, we'll get that error. But if we go back to the root, the site is still up. Now, this is because one of the instances went down and it's being restarted, but the other two keep serving traffic and Azure knows not to send traffic to that container while it's down. All right, now that's pretty cool and it really is the best way to scale, but this is a premium option, which means that it's kind of a pricey one. You get what you pay for. So remember that when you add an instance, you're adding another B1 service plan instance and B1 itself is $38 approximately per month for Linux. So another instance would take you to 77. And then the third, we're at $116 a month. Now we've got great redundancy and scale here, but it is a little bit pricey. We went up three times the normal cost. That's a lot to pay for the problem that we're trying to solve here, which is just redundancy. The other way that we can do this, the more affordable way is with PM2. PM2 is a process manager for Node that is built into Azure, and you can install it from NPM if you want to run it locally. First, we need to create a PM2 configuration file for our project so that PM2 knows how to start our app. So to do that, just run PM2 init, and that'll give us a file that looks something like this. There's two sections here. The one at the top defines settings for our app. And then the one at the bottom, it took me a while to figure this out, but this is if you use PM2 to deploy your application, which you can do. We're not doing that. So I'm just going to pull the deploy section out and focus on the top. Let's change the name here to something a bit more descriptive. And we'll point our script at the startup point, which is bin dub dub dub. And we aren't passing any args to our script. So that can go. See ya. And let's change the instances to two instances. Now this will give us two instances of this app running at the same time. And the rest we'll just leave as is. Uh, we want to restart, auto restart. Yeah, that's right. But we don't want to restart on file changes because we wouldn't want that in production, only on dev. All right, now we can run our app with PM2 locally by executing PM2 start. This starts our app with two instances running, and you can also see that it runs PM2 in the background, and so it returns us to the terminal. 
Now, if I want to see what's happening with our running instances in PM2, we have to run PM2 logs and then the name of our app or process, which is Express App. And I can hit the site at localhost 3000 a few times, prime the logs here. All right, now let's go back and hit the endpoint that crashes because I can't spell the word Iliad. And back in the terminal, you can see the error, but PM2 restarts our application. And we can check on the status of our instances by running PM2 status from the terminal. And both of our instances are online, so the one that went down has already been brought back up. All right, great. So we've got some built-in redundancy here. Now, I should point out that on PM2, when it is using instances, what it wants to do is it wants to run an instance on each CPU that you have. So for instance, if you have eight cores in your computer, then PM2 could run a max of eight instances of your application. And in fact, if I change the instances setting in this file to max and run it on my own machine, you can see that I get eight instances because this computer has eight cores. But in Azure, we only have one CPU per our instance of the B1 service plan. And so if we throw max up there, we'll just get one instance. So what we can do is we can put two instances and that will give us some redundancy in Azure, even though they're both running on the same CPU. What it doesn't give us though, is the full scaling potential that we need. In other words, if we max out the CPU, then not only is our app gonna hang, but PM2 is gonna hang and we're not gonna have any instances at all. And in that case, we would want something like the scale out option. Now, if I crash node by going to the read endpoint in Azure, our site is still online because we have multiple instances and PM2 can start our instance faster than the container orchestrator can. And also I don't have to pay any more for this, which is great. It leaves me more money to spend on important things in life like Lego sets. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to check out all the other Azure casts and I'll see you again soon.